You suck with Scrag. Admit it. Oh, go on, admit it. And today, I'm going to tell you why. Do you heed the call of the Great Moor, or does its whispers leave you stumped? Well, don't worry. Over-tyrant Greaseball Blaketooth is going to look after you, and today we'll be diving deep into why you suck with the Ogres and Scrag the Slaughterer as a faction. After today, your Scrag campaigns will firmly be in the bag. As a disclaimer, this is not a guide for multiplayer. It would take more than a direct line to a hungry god to explain why you're so terrible at that. My name is Blake and I bid you my fondest welcome to Blake's Takes, where today I'll be giving you my take on why you're just awful with Scrag. Is my take hot or not? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed today's video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps the channel out. Now, we'll plunder and feast on any man, any beast. Doesn't matter, we'll snack on them all. They scream and they run, but that's part of the fun, because the ogres are coming to get ya. Reason you suck with Scrag. Number one, you don't blitz the border princes. Finally, a faction that all of us Warhammer fans can appreciate. One we can all cosplay till our heart's content. <laughs> I'm really very depressed. The great thing about the Ogres is their mass and speed, which you can use to crush your enemies. But do you know how to do this? You start at war with the Border Princes. They're unique as a starting enemy because they begin with a huge amount of territory and you'll be forced to attack in two separate directions, as you'll slap bang in the middle of them. Speed is a necessity. You are not well liked by your neighbours, so it is imperative to dispatch your starting enemy as quickly as possible, as there will be a lot more fighting to come. You cannot, under any circumstances, let the Border Princes live long enough for you to be embroiled in more wars. Fighting multi-front wars in the early game is far from advisable, so speed is the name of the game. Once you've taken Matorka, I advise you take the city of Akendorf to prevent a multi-front war with the Border Princes occurring. As Akendorf is their most northerly territory, you'll be confining them to their southern starting territories. Now, after you've taken Matorka, recruit two more Ogre Bulls and hire another Lord. This Lord will follow you around to lap up experience in the coming fights. Have him follow Scrag to Akendorf in the next turn. Make sure you hire a Slaughtermaster, not an Ogre Tyrant. I'll explain why shortly. Now, sieges are particularly painful as the Ogres. Your units are too thick to get through the streets properly, and your chunky boys will often fall victim to the terrible AI pathfinding. We're boring! We're so boring! Well, don't worry. That very same AI is pretty terrible, and there's a straightforward way of tricking them to make your life a lot easier. Deploy all of your units on one side of the city, and then simply move them around to the other when the battle starts. This causes the enemy to bunch all of their units on one side of the city, while you quickly trot over to the other side of the city, bash the gates down, and establish a foothold within the settlement. This will allow your units to get inside the settlement unassailed. Use your Gorges and Sabre Tusks to flank around the city to feast on their ranged units, while your Bulls, supported by Noblars, clear out the remaining melee troops. It's a simple enough tactic. You can also use your Gorges to stealthily infiltrate settlements. Use your Building Bomb ability on the gates of a settlement, and then sneak your Gorges in to distract and confuse the enemy. You can easily get the enemy to overcommit forces to deal with the Gorges threat, once they've been detected, letting the considerable heft of your main force barge into the city and consume the inhabitants. If you're feeling super cheesy, you can try and stealthily move your gorges in to capture the victory point, but my ogres were always far too hungry for those kind of shenanigans. Anyway, the Stone Shatterer building bomb ability will be your saving grace in sieges. Use it against barricades protecting archers when you're in the settlement, to make an easy meal of them. Now Akendorf is yours, but you're not done yet. The Border Princes have a lot of territory in the south which you'll have to rush down and deal with. 
They also start with another large army in the south from turn one, which will have swollen in size from the beginning turns. It will have become engorged. Now, this is where you employ one of your best superpowers. I am hungry. That's right, the power of meat. Use the come and get it offering to the Great Moor to supercharge your campaign movement speed by an extra 20%. This will allow you to rush down to the south and clear out the rest of the border princes. Now, how do I deal with the great mass of enemies that have been forming whilst I've been away in Atkendorf? I hear you cry. Well, luckily, I'm going to tell you. Right now. Reason you suck with Scrag? Number two. You don't know how your early game armies work. The battles you've had up to this point have been child play. Your ogres have been gallivanting through the enemy's lines, snacking and feeding on the small morsels being thrown at you. But now you've come against a force which actually threatens you. How do we beat them into submission? Well, this requires an understanding of your early game units and what they are best suited for. You see, your bulls have a good charge and damage, but they lack durability, so they will rapidly become the cuckolds of the fighting relationship as they're a big target with low armour and low melee defence. You should not leave them in a prolonged fight, as they'll get their thick cheeks vigorously clapped due to all of the above. You need to think of them as a shock cavalry. Charge them in to do a lot of damage, bring them back to charge in again. You get the most value from your bulls by charging them in and out of my wife. Oh my! I mean, the enemy. At the beginning of a challenging battle, you want to again call upon your meaty superpowers and have a pre-battle feast. This boosts your mass, speed and charge bonus, which will help pull your rogers in and out of fights and increase their damage when they charge back in. These benefits are very strong, so be sure to remember to use them. Then you have your Sabre Tusk pack. These units may seem strong on paper, but unfortunately they have a critical weakness, and that's the oh-so-dreaded Rampage mechanic. If they get within a pubic hair's reach of another unit, you will lose control of them, and they will likely impale themselves on the nearest spear unit they can find. You cannot rely on these units, your best bet to get some value out of them is to try and hide them in some foliage and get them to pounce on some unsuspecting ranged units. But as soon as you unleash them to attack something, they will likely throw themselves into a bad situation. So I think of them as a fire and forget unit. That is, if I use them to attack things. More on that in a second. And then you have your Noblars. Now, these guys may seem weak on paper, and they are, but they have a surprising talent which you need to utilise in the early game, and that's the fact that they seem to act as a global taunt for the enemy. Simply send them to places where your ogres aren't, and often the AI will overcommit to fighting them. Have your noblars simply run away once they've caught the attention of some enemy units, dragging them away from the fight whilst your ogres crush smaller pockets of resistance. Remember, a unit of Noblars will basically be beaten by almost anything in the game, so simply distracting just one unit means they will probably have generated more value than they could ever possibly generate through their combat effectiveness. Use this to your advantage. The same can be done with Sabre Tusks. You can also use them like a red rag to a bull, and get the AI to chase after them too. They're faster than Noblars, but can rampage, so their distracting missions may end up short-lived. You will effectively be sacrificing those units, but as both Noblars and Sabre Tusks have pretty low leadership and a reasonably quick movement speed, they will break and rout quickly, and they'll escape pursuers, so the unit will not normally be wiped out. All the while, your ogres pound the life out of the silly humans, 
you could say that the human strategy has really gone to pot. So remember, use your ogre bulls to cycle charge the enemy. Don't leave them in a prolonged combat if you can help it, and make the most of that thick bull charge that they have. Be sure to use your saber tusks and noblars as distractions. Have them drag the enemy armies on a wild goose chase whilst your ogres run a train on their remaining forces. Your early game forces excel in bullying smaller pockets of resistance with overwhelming mass. They're not good at taking fair fights. Use your noblars and saber tusks as distractions, sending them off to the flanks to pull apart enemy formations whilst your ogres get down to business. Reason you suck with Scrag, number three. You don't know how to use Scrag. Some donkey. Scrag has a lot of powerful tools at his disposal which can turn the tide for you in your battles. But do you know how to use him? You need to send Scrag against the right targets. Avoid dedicated melee heroes and lords as they'll do considerable damage to him. Feel free to toss him into blobs of infantry. He'll do just fine against those. Scrag is an extremely potent spellcaster, but I like to focus on getting healer in his blue line of skills as the first buffs to go after. In the early game, you'll be taking a lot of casualties as the ogres. Your units lack armor and melee defense, and the fact that they're all melee units, yes, even your noblar trappers I wouldn't classify as a dedicated missile unit, their missile attack has a very short range and they're not particularly fast, so they'll likely end up in melee. Well, your units will inevitably take a lot of casualties, so replenishment is very important for the ogres. And this is why I said, get a Slaughtermaster Lord earlier. Both Scrag and Slaughtermaster Lords have access to the Blue Line Healer buff. Ogre Tyrants do not. You'll take a lot of casualties at the beginning of your campaign. I guarantee it. It's very important to be able to replenish these. Later into your campaign, when you're able to field higher tier units, this is less important. But in the early game, when you only have bulls, saber tusks and noblars, it is important. Then, along this blue line of skills, you get the Reader of Portents ability, which boosts research rate by 10%. Now this is very important for ogres, as where you are on the research tree dictates how many camps you can place. More on them later but you're one of the few races where research really dictates how powerful you are. Now, Slaughtermaster Laws can also get the Reader of Portents ability. You see where I'm going with this. Have Scrag and a load of Slaughtermaster Lords boost your research to climb the tech tree faster. Now once I have the Reader of Portents ability, I start looking at Scrag spells. They're good spells, but very expensive to cast. Get the Blood Gruel passive and the Bone Crusher ability maxed out and you can reliably heal yourself whilst dealing massive damage to blobs of infantry in combat. Despite Scrag's intimidating appearance, remember he's not a dedicated melee specialist. He will lose in melee with lords like Karl Franz. He's solid against infantry, but remember he can be quite fragile due to his lack of armour and large hitbox, so watch out for ranged units also. Feel free to unleash him on infantry, but make sure to keep his health topped up by spamming the Bone Crusher spell. So remember, Scrag, as well as all Slaughtermaster Lords, can get access to a 10% research rate buff, which will dramatically increase your power on the campaign map, because you'll unlock more camps quickly. Along this line, you'll also get early access to boosted replenishment rate, which will be very handy for your fragile early game forces. Get to that skill on the blue line tree, then start picking up Scrag spells with a focus on his passive and the Bone Crusher spell, so he can annihilate blobs of infantry and heal himself in the process. Scrag is a good melee fighter, but not a dedicated one. He will lose to melee specialists. Keep him to blobs of infantry instead, where he excels in cutting them down. Yeah, you go get him, Scrag. Reason you suck with Scrag. Number four, you don't prioritize growth. In the early game, you're very limited with what you can recruit. You're stuck with trashy noblars, saber tusks, and ogre bulls. These units are hard to use and generally perform poorly. You need to prioritize getting your first camp down as soon as possible and growing it to tier three. 
Now, as soon as you put your camp down, you want to immediately get the spare tent building for growth, as well as the technology larger fire pits, which gives a plus five to camp growth at all times. This also comes with the added benefit of Butcher's Spices, the technology preceding it, which increases your replenishment rate. Now, camp foraging is a bit of a trap in my opinion. You get a lot of extra growth, but it's only active when you're in enemy territory. You want to conquer settlements as ogres. You want a large land empire, and the reason why I'll get onto shortly, but I'd advise against camp foraging and going for the safer plus five camp growth at all times. You could, in theory, take camp foraging and pop down a camp by a final weakened enemy city and basically station an army in there to ensure the camp doesn't get killed by the enemy settlement. That would work in theory and it would rush your growth faster, but I think the plus five route at all times is simpler and safer, especially as you want to be squashing enemies around you to neutralize them as threats. The reason you want to make a mad dash for growth is simple. Ogre units are filthy overpowered once you hit tier three in a camp. Let me express this in graph format. You see, you have your tier one and tier two, which feel pretty horribly weak and then boom, oh my God, look how strong we are. Oh God, oh, whoa, 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 wow, 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 look at that. Oh, so much damage, so much damage. Oh my God, oh my God, oh, 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 oh. And then we're back down to tier four and five where you drop back down in power again, relative to your competition, of course. You don't start getting weaker when you get to higher camp tiers, it's just your competition will be catching up with you. Now, the reason for this absurd power spike at level three is primarily due to your lead belchers. These guys are absolute powerhouses and they will shred anything they come into contact with at this tier. At this level, most of your enemies will be fielding armies of infantry, which these things absolutely mow down. They have amazing range, so they will outrange all enemy archers and do insane damage to infantry blobs. I take two of these in every army going forward. They're like deck gunners from the Vampire Coast, except not disappointing in every single way. Oh. They are only recruitable from tier three camps with the mineral seam building built, so this should be an absolute focus of yours. To get the most value out of your lead belchers, try to hit your enemies from the flank, letting your cannonballs pass through the maximum number of troops possible. Despite hefting a massive cannon around, your lead belchers are actually quite nimble on their feet, so try repositioning them to get those naughty flanking attacks. Then you get access to powerful melee ogres as well, that being man-eaters and iron guts. Now, Iron Guts are good troops, and you can actually get them from your regular settlements, as well as camps, but I'd advise not bothering with them and sticking with man-eaters. The reason for this is your highest tier monstrous infantry troops are also man-eaters, but just different variants. Shields, pistols, great weapons, they're all man-eaters. If you get Iron Guts, then they follow a different red line skill at the max level, the one which buffs ogre bulls at the end of the red line tech tree. They're a bit awkward because you'd have to spend an extra skill point to fully buff them. Man eaters at level three are excellent. They don't have the ranged attack or shield of their later tier four and five brothers, but they have the exact same melee killing stats. They're really solid, but that's kind of why the ogres drop off past tier three. It's just man eaters from there. The tier five ones with pistols and bonus versus large great weapons are decent, but they're not amazing. Bonus versus large man eaters can do well versus multiple entity cavalry units, but I find they really struggle versus large single entity monsters. They just don't seem to kill them very quickly. And that's a problem in the late game when large single entity monsters become much more prevalent. Man eaters with pistols can punch a fair bit of damage into one, but if the enemy has a lot of them, they're not going to be able to deal with them all. So things can get pretty dicey when you're dealing with, say, an Arachnorok spam army from the Orcs. Your lead belchers also don't do much damage to single entities. They're very inaccurate, so they'll often miss. So bear this in mind. At level three, you also get access to the Noblar Scrap Launcher, which is actually a very solid artillery piece. It's inaccurate, but can do extreme damage to blobs of enemies. 
They also only take one turn to recruit, which is nice because all of your other good troops take two turns. So, in short, when your camps, let me repeat that, your camps, not your regular settlements, reach level 3, you get a massive spike in power relative to your competition, due to the new powerful units you can field in your armies. You need to take advantage of this power spike and rampage through all of your surrounding enemies using this newfound power. You effectively switch from being a rush faction to a faction that plays a bit more like the dwarves with devastating ranged firepower. Have your scrap launchers and lead belchers decimate the enemy from afar, then move in your man-eaters to clear up the remnants. Reason you suck with Scrag. Number 5. You don't know how Ogonomics works. I don't know what's happening. It seems our profits have dropped 37%. I'm afraid we have a bad image, sir. Market research shows people see you as something of an ogre. Yeah, you ought to club them and eat their bones! Yes, you absolutely should. In a similar manner to how your combat styles will evolve, the way you make money will evolve too as you progress down the tech tree. Firstly, and what you'll be doing in the early game a lot of, is clubbing and eating the bones of your enemies and sacking their settlements. You make a lot of money from sacking, and this will be your primary money-making method until you have five or more camps set up, which you should be rushing towards on the tech tree. Don't stop to go into another branch. Select one branch on the tech tree and focus on it to unlock all of the camps, with your ultimate goal of getting to Sky Titan's plateaus. This effectively unlocks unlimited camps for yourself and is something which you should be looking to get as soon as possible. I'll explain why shortly. Now, in the early game, similar to our old pal Scarbrand, you will likely be running at an income deficit. That's normal. Your normal settlements don't provide much money. Yet. And your camps aren't built up. You'll need to be aggressive and sack settlements to fund your armies. I advise heading straight into the Empire and picking a fight with them once you've consolidated your starting provinces. Your lead belchers outrange all of the Empire's missile units and they likely won't have artillery if you abuse the tier 3 power spike which I spoke of earlier. Mortars will do a lot of damage to your noblars, but who cares about them, and they'll barely tickle your ogres. They don't unlock cannons until tier 4, giving you a window of opportunity in which the Empire is particularly vulnerable to your onslaught. They also have a high concentration of very wealthy cities for you to sack, so I'd highly advise stomping all over the Empire as your early game money-making strategy. Now you want to be investing into your camps to get them to the maximum tier as quickly as possible, and this is why we occupy settlements, for this lovely buff here. All non-camp buildings income is boosted faction-wide. This buff is a game changer and should dictate your middle and late game strategy. It increases as you level up your ogre camp, so you want your ogre camps at maximum level as soon as possible to get the best iteration of this buff. Now you have your settlements, which on the surface don't look like they make a lot of money, as you can only grow them to level 3 for all of these settlements. But with the compounding buffs from your camps, they can actually generate you a fortune. As you'll be conquering a lot of land, you won't initially have the money to get all settlements levelled up, so you need to prioritise. Look for settlements which you have conquered, which have resource buildings that generate income, and, of course, harbours. These are where you'll make your money. Prioritise building these up over settlements which don't have any natural resources or access to a port. Now, this has been a bit of a mouthful, so I've made a handout that'll help you understand how to better build up your ogre empire, available in the description below. Use it well, and devour this world for the more. You will start making a biblical amount of money from this in the middle and late game, which you can use to fund more armies to sack and occupy more settlements. When you unlock the Sky Titans Plateau technology, which should be your absolute focus while sprinting down the tech tree, you can deploy another camp every time you level a camp up to tier 5. This technology allows you to create an infinite number of camps to infinitely compound the wealth of your settlements. It's free real estate. When you're in the sacking phase of this operation, you'll get access to Noblar Treasurers. You gain them when you win battles at a negative income. They also slap another 10% income modifier onto the province you're in. 
be sure to put these guys on all the lords and heroes you can. Contracts can be quite good, but they're totally random. Sometimes you can get a very lucrative one that ties in with your current campaign objectives, but most of the time they're very far away on some far-flung objective which aren't worth going for. There's no consequence for failing a contract though, so just pick one up when they generate every 10 turns. Other than that, don't worry too much about them. The totally random nature of them means I can't really give you a strategy for them, which is curious for a strategy game, but hey ho. Remember, you begin as a sacking faction. Be aggressive. Sack and occupy settlements and build up your coffers. You'll likely be running at a deficit in the early game. This is natural. Don't be alarmed. Just sack and occupy more. As you move along the tech tree and unlock more camps, these will compound your conquered territory's income. When you have some camps built up, then they start making your income streams. Be sure to prioritise building up settlements that have access to harbours and natural resources that generate income. Every settlement should get the loot stash building to further compound your riches. All settlements are valuable to you, some just more so than others. So you need to prioritise them with the limited wealth you have at the early and mid game. If you follow these steps, then by the late game, you'll be richer than God. Reason you suck with Scrag? Number 6. You don't use camp recruitment properly. As discussed in Reason 5, your conquered settlements should primarily be used for making you money. Ogre settlements can only reach Tier 3 and don't give you access to advanced military buildings which form the backbone of your mid and late game armies. No, recruitment should primarily be done through your camps. Now, your military buildings are very expensive, so in the early game it'll be difficult for you to actually build more than one recruitment centre, but you have a way around this. In the offerings of the Great Moor, you can use your food to make global recruitment take far less time, using the Fill Your Bellies offering. This reduces recruitment time by two turns. As all of your good units take two turns to recruit, they will take four turns to recruit globally, so this is a necessity. Now, another little known trick you can do is recruit armies in your camps to preload an army. Most of your good units take two turns to build, so it can take a while to get an army up and running. But if you recruit them in your camp garrison, then you can have armies ready to go by recruiting a lord and simply swapping them over. You can also use this camp army swapping mechanic if you want to change out your tools later in the game. Instead of disbanding highly experienced lower tier troops, you can put them in a camp to potentially use them at a later date. Say you need the anti-large killing power of man-eaters with great weapons, but you've only got man-eaters with iron fists. Well, it's an issue no longer. Swap them into your camp, and then you can save your shielded ogres for later use instead of disbanding them. Remember, your recruitment buildings are very expensive, so you should be making use of the Fill Your Bellies offering to the Great Moor when you have only one recruitment camp in the early game. This will remove two turns off your global recruitment time. Your camps can be used to preload armies, recruit armies in advance of the time you'll be needing them, and you can store ogre units in your camp garrisons if you want to swap them out and save them for later. Get the Noblar's box building to reduce the upkeep of these garrisoned units. They can then be picked up from the camp later instead of you disbanding them. The Ogres have the tools to keep a lot of armies on the back burner should you need them in a pinch. Don't forget about them. Reason you suck with Scrag? Number 7. You don't know how to use your heroes. Ogres are quite unique in the fact that all of their heroes have an extremely potent set of tools which they bring to the table, and none of them should be left behind. Ogre Hunters boost your campaign movement speed and can eventually get a Stonehorn mount, whilst also packing a serious punch with their armour-piercing, anti-large javelins. Ignore their Sabre Tusk perks. While useful in the early game, Sabre Tusks are rapidly outclassed in the middle and late game. I'd advise against putting points into levelling them up, level up your Hunter's combat ability instead. When they get access to the Stonehorn mount at level 15, they'll be nearly unstoppable. But your heroes replenish casualties whilst offering magic of the moor. They're also reasonable melee fighters, but like Scrag, you don't want to send them against melee specialists, 
unless you're absolutely desperate, but they can hold their own whilst healing themselves and others, so they're always very useful. Firebellies will absolutely slaughter enemies in sieges with their fire magic. The Flamestorm is your saving grace in sieges, as your chunky units will often get stuck and bug out. You need to rush to this spell as quickly as possible. Drop it in a walled settlement and watch it go to work, as your firebelly racks up absurd numbers of kills. Nice. Your firebellies also have the wall breaker ability, so as they're dropping offensive magic on your enemies, they can break down the walls for your ogres to march in. I like to use fire bellies to break down walls as it gives them better opportunities to drop offensive spells on infantry blobs, as well as the fact they're a single entity which makes healing very efficient on them, so all of the archer fire that they take will barely make a dent on them. I like to get one of these heroes into all of my armies. Your main trouble will be with hero limits. Now hunters aren't too much of a problem. You can get extra hunter capacity by building the tier 3 gorger cave in your regular settlements as well as camps, and I highly suggest you build a few of these in places which don't have a harbour or an income generating natural resource building to compete with it. The trouble comes with butchers and fire bellies. You can only increase the number of these heroes by getting the tier 3 slaughter masters table and the tier 4 camp oven. These buildings can only be built in camps so you'll be locked at a cap of 5 Butcher Heroes and 8 Fire Bellies, taking into account the Fire Mouth Tribute technology which gives you an extra 3 of them, until you've unlocked Sky Titan Plateaus and the infinite camps that come along with it. So remember, all of your heroes have excellent utility. You should try and have one of each in every army if possible. You can only boost Fire Belly and Butcher Hero numbers in camps, but you can increase Hunter numbers everywhere and I suggest you put down the tier 3 Gorger Cave in settlements that have no natural resources or harbours that can compete with the build slot. Use your heroes well and you will dominate your enemies for the more. Reason you suck with Scrag Number 8. You don't know who your MVPs are. Oh look at this big stone horn. It looks so savage and dominant. It must be the most valuable unit in your roster, right? Wrong. Stone horns aren't bad units by any means, but I find them clumsy to use and they don't seem to rack up many kills. They're also focused on anti-infantry, which, as the ogres, you already have in droves, so I don't find them to be worth it. The harpoon launchers are okay, but again, very pricey for what you get, and they take three turns to recruit. You can heal them very effectively with more magic, but the troll gut spell is very expensive, and you can only heal one unit at a time, so you'll be unlikely to heal many of them. No, your most valuable units are crushers. These units are so damn good. Cavalry is often overlooked in Warhammer 3 as clunky and a bit bad, but you really shouldn't overlook these guys. They basically have the mass and collision attacks of chariots mixed with the stand and fight killing power of a melee cavalry unit. These guys are excellent. Every late game army should have some of these in them. In fact, they can basically be the entire army. They're an amazing cavalry unit that dominate the battlefield. I recommend getting the Great Weapons variants over the Iron Fists, as bonus versus large is something the Ogres struggle with, and Great Weapon Crushers deliver this in spades. When fighting infantry formations, keep your Crushers on the move using their huge charge attack to cut a bloody swathe through infantry units. Pull them in and out and you'll see a fine red mist of what was left of your enemy's infantry formations. They're a fantastic all-rounder that can deal with both large and small units. I'd wager that they're the best cavalry in the game. Get them, you won't be disappointed. So that's why you suck with Scrag. Do you agree with my take on this? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps the channel out. And a massive thank you to my Patreon supporters, D, Joshua Krager, and Paugus. I've been Blake, delivering my take. Thank you all so much for watching.